boy, I really do look like I'd fit right in as a Yankees fan. I don't know how I feel about that. And now Mark McGuire. His historic chase continues. One home run shy of Babe Ruth. Two shy of Roger Maris is 61. 61 is a HBO film from 2001 directed by Billy Crystal. On paper, the basis of the film is the retelling of the true story of Roger Maris and Mickey Mantle's home run chase for Babe Ruth's single season home run record during the 1961 MLB season. Clearly the most well-remembered film project featuring Billy Crystal from 2001. Put the thing back where it came from, or I'll poke myself in the eye. But to me, the impact of this film goes well beyond it just being a piece of entertainment. This is something that helped shape two of my greatest passions in life. This is something that connects to me on a level that I can't imagine many other people could ever relate to. This is my story about my relationship with a film and how any piece of art can have profound impacts that the creators never could have foreseen. This film was a longtime passion project of Billy Crystal's, who grew up a diehard Yankee fan. And I think even if you're someone who's not familiar with baseball, the film just has the heart and staying power that comes from a place of passion that I think anyone can just feel on a gut level. It's clearly made by a fan for fans. One way in which this shows is the doppelganger casting gimmick. Not all of the names are super obscure either. Anthony Michael Hall sticks out as Whitey Ford, and you've also got Shooter McGavin doing a surprisingly spot-on impression of Yankees broadcasting legend Mel Allen. Alrighty, alright, Skinny Brown into the windup. Here's the first pitch of the ball game. Richardson hits it to right center field. Earl Robinson moving to his right, under it, and takes it for the first out. Oh yeah, now it's time. All right, here's the windup. Pasquale delivers. Oh, that'll do it here in the sixth. Update for Mickey. Oh my god! Even smaller parts like Hoyt Wilhelm fit this mold as well. In <laughs> Why yes, I did only bring up Hoyt Wilhelm's name so I could make that joke. But then you of course have the two main actors, Thomas Jane as Mickey Mantle and Barry Pepper as Roger Maris. Perfect choices not only in terms of looks, but for what they needed to bring for these characters. I'll get more into that later, but this is a baseball movie, so how is the baseball action? Pretty damn good. The attention to detail isn't quite on the same level as, say, Major League. There's definitely points where you can tell that they cheated the shot a bit, but it's not distracting. To best exemplify this, let's compare a base stealing sequence from this film with a similar one from 42, which came out 12 years after this. But there goes one! It's a line drive for the game! Boy, this could be trouble! It's gonna go in between them! I know Jackie Robinson was a freak athlete, but I don't even think Usain Bolt in his prime could steal a base with that bad of a jump. The sad part is, there's actually a really easy way this could have been fixed. Just remove a few frames of the pitcher as he commits toward home plate, and insert Jackie taking off there. You got a slightly tighter play. It's all in the editing. Whichever one of you put this sequence together, Sorry, but you did kind of a sh job. The fact that a film over a decade older than this with a significantly lower budget could pull off a more complicated sequence more convincingly kind of speaks for itself. Something else that not everyone will notice is the attention to detail in the sound design. The sound from the microphone in this scene feels very genuine to the time period. He was more than a ball player. He was everything that is special about this game. He was everything that is special about America. Small things like this show me that there was clear thought and effort put into just about every aspect of this film. 
That goes for both technical and thematic elements. Segue to thematic section now. Roger's conflict as he chases history through the film's timeline stems from him fighting off a number of burdensome outside forces. Those can basically be narrowed down to three. The media, the fans, and his own temperament. Let's dissect how the film portrays this. Some of you watching might be expecting me to launch into some kind of tirade about fake news here, but instead I think what the film portrays is a bit of a dose of reality that we often whitewash concepts from the past. How many times have you heard a more, let's call them, time-seasoned person lament about how the news just isn't what it used to be. This is interesting because it's like, this is one of the clearest examples of, uh, it's just, they're not objective. These, these are not journalists. These no. are not people that are just reporting on actual facts. They had to have this opinion, this dour face, and everyone was very upset, very upset. Which, I mean, I get a, I understand it if you're not a journalist. I understand if you're just a person, but the, you're not just a person, you're a fucking journalist. The fact of the matter is, as long as there is reporting and demand for any subject, narratives have been and will continue to be formed, regardless of intent. Even reporting just the facts is commitment to a narrative, and the reason is the same now as it was back in 1961. I don't speculate, Artie. I write what I know. Look, with all due respect, no, I don't have a regular column. There's 15 papers in this town, we can't all write the same thing. This aspect of the film is a bit more intriguing and substantial once you realize that baseball was still in its golden age in 1961, the unquestioned national pastime, and New York and the Yankees were also the undisputed kings of the sport, and therefore the media surrounding it. It's made abundantly clear throughout the runtime that Roger is more of a target for criticism simply because Mickey has become quote-unquote above it during his decade of service time with the Yankees to that point. Come on, Sam, what are we talking about? It's one game. We scored more runs than we did. That's all there is to it. Oh, by the way, I love to call him today. Simon says shove it up your ass. I wasn't finished yet. Yeah, you were. Hey, look, Mickey's ahead uh, 43 to 41. You haven't had a home run in a week. You're falling behind Ruth's pace. Is the pressure starting to get to you there, Ross? Feeling a little gun shy, maybe? You know, I don't get it. I, I strike out, you say I'm swinging for the fences, I bunt, and you, you say I'm afraid to hit a home run. It's You're only a game up on the Tigers. Shouldn't you forget about the record and focus on winning the pennant? That's what I'm doing. Have you seen the sporting news poll? No, Sam, I try not to read the papers. He was a very decent, honest man who gave the press honest answers. It wasn't enough when they're fighting for sound bites competition fighting television you had to get a good story you know that's part of our story too is uh, something that that's uh, you know very relevant uh, today and what goes on because the media has a lot of power it can have a crushing effect on a human being which leads us to the next outside force that plagues roger through the film remember how i said this was a film made for baseball fans that's still true, but the enablement of the conflict in this film can, in a way, be traced back to those very same fans. On the surface, the way the fans treat Roger could come off as cartoonish and hyperbolic, if it weren't kind of accurate. As I mentioned earlier, baseball was king at the time, and Yankee fans are particularly infamous for turning on their own team, even to this day. I'm unquestionably a sports fan myself, but watching this movie when I was younger made me realize for the first time, maybe getting emotionally invested to the point of obsession isn't what I should be doing with my fandom. I'm sure the real life events portrayed in the film had a similar effect on Billy Crystal, who was there to witness the craze around the home run chase up close and personal. Some who aren't overly familiar with baseball history might not fully understand that the reason people held Babe Ruth's record in such high regard was because his style of play revolutionized the game to a degree that we'll likely never see in any other sport again. To put into perspective just how dominant Ruth was in his era, just listen to this true stat that the film mentions. The year that Babe hit 60. He had more home runs than every team in the American League. There's a reason that Ruth remains one of the most iconic athletes in history. 
and in a way it makes sense that the fans wouldn't be satisfied seeing Roger Maris break the record and see it as Mickey's to break. This frenzy was no doubt set more ablaze when Commissioner Ford Prick, I mean dick, I mean asshole, I mean frick, went ahead and added the bullsh** separate records rule for a record broken in more than 154 games. Is this one directed at the M&M boys and they chase a Roots record? No. I don't believe you. This film walks an intriguing line because there's so much for fans of the game to enjoy within it, but it also brings to light the highly questionable and often mocked nature of the loud-mouthed reactionaries among us. How does this manifest itself? If you or anyone you know has chastised an athlete for voicing their struggles with mental health because LOL, THAT'S JUST PART OF THE JOB, GET OVER YOURSELF, I highly suggest you watch this film. These things have always been a problem. It's not a new thing that the soft new generation has brought upon us or whatever you want to tell yourself. This is where the true heart of the film lies. How does a man who broke one of the most highly touted records in all of sports eventually end up saying this near the end of his life? So since I can't find the clip anywhere online, I'm just going to read this quote from Ken Burns' baseball documentary. Quote Roger Maris, It would have been a hell of a lot more fun if I had never hit those 61 home runs. All it brought me was headaches. While not 100% accurate in terms of the timeline, nearly everything portrayed on this front did indeed happen. The incident where he signed an X on the ball jokingly was real. The salacious headlines were real. The booing in his home stadium was real. Can you believe this? They're booing him in his own ballpark. Yeah, I wonder why, Artie. I couldn't find anything detailing the hostile Detroit fan or the doxing of his home by a local paper, but those seem more or less to be personifications of pressure he was under, so I'll allow it. The root of this comes from the fact that Roger Maris simply didn't fit in in the New York environment. He grew up in North Dakota and relished his Midwestern family life playing for the then Kansas City A's. He wasn't thrilled with the idea of being traded to New York, but that was before players had any leverage and it happened whether he wanted it to or not. Daddy? Yeah? I liked it better when you played in Kansas City. Yeah, I know, me too. I'd also like to point out a smaller detail presented in this conversation between Roger and his wife, Pat, portrayed by Jennifer Crystal Foley. We talked about this, and you know, we can't afford two households. 38,000 goes a lot farther in Missouri than it does New York. A lot of people don't realize that pre-1970 professional athletes didn't earn anywhere near the ridiculous amount of money they do now. The 38,000 number that she says is actually inaccurate. His base salary was actually $32,000 in 1961 about six times the median U.S. household income at the time. He also got a total of $10,000 more in bonuses because the team won the World Series that year. This was on the higher end of MLB player earnings, having just won the MVP the year before. Now the average MLB salary is $1.2 million, roughly 25 times the median salary for the country as a whole. This isn't a massively relevant detail to the plot, but it's nice to see that shift in dynamics at least hinted at in some way. I just think it's neat. The film shows that despite being very clearly bothered by their presence, Roger would still take time to talk to the press and regularly give answers that were not unsimilar to Derek Jeter, a media darling who was often coined Captain Cliché. But because of the outside circumstances I've already gone into detail over, the media naturally played into the narrative that Maris wasn't the one who should break the record, and that it was Mickey's time to take the crown. It's interesting to note that Roger and Mickey are presented in a bit of a yin and yang aspect here. Because Mickey is the superstar and has built a reputation as being the guy for the city, 
His reckless behavior and actions are pretty much just glossed over, and the few who bring it up are basically brushed to the side. Despite these visible differences, the two remained friends, and yes, they did indeed live together during the season, but that didn't stop a manufactured feud from being reported. Growing between are we feud? Yeah, I guess so. It's on TV. Well, Fuck you, then. I relate deeply to Roger's plight. Being a pretty reserved and introverted person myself, I've had similar experiences where someone takes my attitude of being just a head down, do what needs to be done kind of guy as a cold dismissiveness. Meanwhile, it seems like others just aren't held under the same microscope. It always seems like somebody's being uncharitable, and it really hurts to be unfairly singled out. You told me, yeah, you told me a lot of stuff about a lot of different things, and then you just go out and do whatever the hell you want, and nobody says shit about it to you. Hey, don't get on my case just because everybody else is on yours! It's not my problem! Right, it's my problem. My problem! Eventually, he does learn to push it to the side in some way, but only after being pushed to the absolute max culminating in the scene where we witness his hair falling out from stress and requesting not to play in game 154, aka his last chance to legitimately break the record. And through it all, he was never truly able to relish his accomplishments. Despite being only 27 during the 1961 season, Maris never hit nearly as well again, suffered debilitating injuries, and ultimately finished with a solid career that just happened to have an amazing peak. Or in other words, Maris is no more than a good big league ball player. He's colorless, he's never hit 300, and is often surly. There just isn't anything deeply heroic about the man. All of these things are technically true, but then again, do the traits of Roger Maris not describe a typical underdog story? Someone we could all respect and get behind? In a world that made sense, yes. Unfortunately, that's not the world we live in. This experience certainly didn't help Maris' outlook on the big city, and probably didn't do any favors for his long-term play either. Upon his retirement, he was known by friends and family to never be seen without his 1967 World Series ring he won as a member of the Cardinals, and generally had a greater attachment to it than the two he won in New York. And I can honestly say I don't blame him. The separate, single-season home run records remained until 1991, when Faye Vincent, the commissioner of baseball, ordered that there be only one record. Roger Maris died six years earlier, never knowing that the record belonged to him. That's probably why he died, was because of the stress of those years. And, um never really allowing himself to to release it and uh he smoked three packs a day well so what do you do man you just get used to it no but you got to now that we've discussed the thematic elements of the film let's talk about how stupid sports discourse is Much of the plot surrounding the home run chase hinges on the fact that it would have to be broken in 154 games. This is because Commissioner Ford asshole, I mean asshole, I mean fed, I mean decided to go ahead and be like, whoa, 162 game season doesn't count, L plus ratio plus babe better. Tell me you don't see the parallels between how Maris's record was treated here and how people treat steroid users who have surpassed it. A certain amount of people will always find a way to discredit the numbers. I would know because I was one of them. Not to say I'm pro PEDs, they give you an unfair advantage and anyone who claims otherwise is either lying or massively misinformed. But like it or not, 73 is the new record. There's not gonna be an asterisk put on it. The Reds didn't get an asterisk put on their 1919 title when the White Sox threw the series, and the Astros aren't getting an asterisk on their 2017 title because they cheated. Honestly, the making of this video has been a solidifying experience in terms of how I feel about this subject. I don't watch baseball just to root for a certain outcome. I watch it because I love it. While I'll still have my preferred outcomes, 
I'll let the rest of you have at it and actually fully enjoy myself. Now I'm sure you're thinking, okay, interesting, but when are we going to get to the part where you explain the video title and that intro? Hey everybody, so I decided while I was writing this script that there was no way that I could put this part in the video in a way that would fit a typical video essay format. Like, it's just not possible. Like, at least not possible in terms of doing it in a way that doesn't feel artificial or like I'm playing myself up too much. And yeah, I'm, I'm not even scripted right now, so I'm just gonna talk about how I relate to this film, and it's either going to work out really well, or it's going to give everybody complete and utter whiplash. So here it goes. The story goes like this. So my dad was born on October 1st, 1961, which is the day that Roger Maris hit his 61st home run, which broke the record. And not just because of that, but my dad developed a love for baseball, and my mom came from a baseball family as well. She was a former All-State pitcher in softball, and my grandpa on her side is a Michigan High School Hall of Fame coach, and he has a state title under his belt. Um, so, yeah, obviously, big, big family for baseball, and it got it was to the point where my older sister was actually named Maris and yeah we were like we were two and a half years apart and growing up we were kind of polar opposites in a in a way like she she was that kid the one that does literally everything she was a three sport athlete she was an honors student. She was the student council president. She did charity work, big brothers, big sisters, anything you can think of, she was doing it. And, she, you know, she made friends with just about everybody, really, really outgoing person. And I was a bit more introverted, to, to say the least. Not like outcast level introverted, but, uh, you know, I definitely had a reclusive streak to me, and and despite that, my sister was definitely one of my best friends. She never said an ill word about me, other than um, these stories that she would tell about me as a newborn baby trying to push her out the top floor window. <laughs> um, but then again, I did try to, I didn't try to, I did. When I was one year old, I punched out her first tooth. So that might, there might be something to that. Maybe I was a demon baby. But anyway, the, the point of me bringing this up is that in her senior year, she was diagnosed with acute myeloid leukemia. And unfortunately, after an eight-month battle, she passed away. It was two weeks to the day after her 18th birthday. And being from a small town, there was a lot of support from her, from, from our peers, if that's how you would say it. Uh, you know, a lot of support for our family, and that's something I always appreciated. She was huge. She was a huge figure in the town. Everybody knew everybody. So a lot of people were really affected and hurt to see this happen. And one of the best gestures was our alma mater school actually retired her number nine for softball. I forgot to mention she wore number nine because of Roger Maris. He... <laughs> There you go. You see it? That's it. It's it's the number nine. <sighs> so, um, yeah. After that, I was uh, 
very, for obvious reasons, in a bit of a bad place. Uh, and yeah, I'll tell this story. Not many people know about it, but uh, so the night before she died, the doctors gave us word that she might not make it through the night. And I remember that hitting me like a shockwave, like it all just came over me at once. Like, oh my God, this is real. This is actually going to happen. And she did end up making it through the night. She kept persevering through, but I was there for about a full day, basically just waiting for it to happen. And I got the overwhelming urge to just leave. So I had my grandpa drive me back home for, for a basketball tournament so I could catch a bus to go to that. And yeah, I went there and played basketball and I was just about home when the news broke that she had passed away. And I have very mixed feelings about that because it does on one hand feel like I missed my chance to say goodbye, but at the same time, it was, it was really hard on me to just be sitting there waiting. Like I just felt like it was going to hurt too much when it finally happened for real. And I've come to terms with that and, and no one needs to worry about me or anything. Just, I thought I'd share that for a bit of extra context. And so, yeah, after that, I was, I think the only thing that really was able to help me move on in a positive way was baseball. Uh, so I got, I got regular playing time on varsity when I was a freshman, which was not a freshman, a sophomore when I, it was about six or five months after she died. And I was hitting near the bottom of the order, and one day I just ran into one and hit my first home run ever, which was like not even Little League had I ever hit a ball over the fence, but I ran into it dead center, pushing like 400 feet, and that was something that helped me realize that I don't have to linger on the past and be sad about the fact that she was, wasn't going to see me do whatever I was going to do with my life. And I could just carry her memory with me and I, and share it. And I feel like this is an opportunity for me to do exactly that. So let me tell you a few other stories. Uh, so she was she was in the grade above where you would typically expect someone to be for her age. She was, she was born in November and, you know, usually if you're a November kid, you're, you're a bit, you're a little older for your grade. She was the youngest person in her grade and she was pitching on varsity for softball as a freshman, but our local little league had rules where you just had to be under 15 to play in the in the top level so she was able to play little league too after she was already pitching against 18 year olds and i remember thinking that was really funny as a kid because you know she was throwing really, really hard, and people were scared of her at that level. And I don't blame them. Uh, what else is a good story? Can I... Uh, may, not a story, but I think my favorite thing about her was the fact that she had the most infectious smile I've ever seen. Like, I don't even say that as 
coming from a place of bias, I don't think. Like, just look at some of these pictures and tell me you don't light up when you see that smile. If if you don't, there's something wrong with you. Uh, so, yeah, that's that. And now you now you're probably wondering like what's the connection to this movie outside of her name and the number 9 well my family is tigers fans and this movie happened to shoot at tiger stadium that's the and that's the reason that's the only away stadium you see in any kind of detail is because that's where it was all shot they like digitally edited or or did a bit of a makeover to make it look more like Yankee Stadium, the you know pre pre renovation Yankee Stadium. Uh, so that's a little bit of an extra connection. I also realized on this most recent watch that there's a writer character named Sam Simon, and he's like the more pessimistic of the bunch of writers that they show, and. I used to want to be a sports writer, and sometimes people would say that my writing was too cynical or pessimistic. Um, I'm not creeped out. You're creeped out. Uh, and then, of course, there's the scene where Roger is telling Mickey about his brother, who was, who, you know, he viewed as, like, his inspiration who who passed away from polio and yeah that's uh remember how i said in the thematic section of the video that i feel for roger's plight because i see a bit of myself in him and that's just the cherry on top uh yeah so i can't get through that scene without crying and there's probably a few other things that I'm forgetting, but the the gist of it is that this movie helped me develop my passion for baseball even more, and it is also one of the first movies that I ever truly recognized as an art form, if that makes any sense, like, it's the first thing that, one of the first things that got me thinking about film concepts or the, the merit to why they were showing things a certain way. And it, it just so happens to have a lot of personal connections toward me and my family. And <clears throat> I am still talking. You know, the gist of what I'm saying is that baseball has been a constant in my life, and I'm still playing in a men's league to this day, uh, so it's always going to be a part of my life. And now, in in real life, there's a there's something happening that I dare say might be a bit of a sign, because... Aaron Judge, the Yankees right fielder who wears number 99, is sitting on 60 homers as of recording this. And yeah, coming up on the 61st anniversary of Roger Maris's record, it's a, it's a bit of a special thing for me and my dad. So we're going to be at the game on October 1st, that Saturday. Uh, we'll, yeah, we'll be sitting out in the outfield. And yeah, needless to say, if it happens that day, if he hits number 61 or 62, it's going to leave a profound impact on me, to say the least. Like, the, it's... It's to the point of coincidence that part of me can't help but feel like there might be something more at play here. There might be something, you know, turning the gears to make this happen. Uh, 
yeah, just to go over it again, 61 home runs Roger Maris hit in 1961. It's coming up on my dad's 61st birthday. And Aaron Judge wears number 99 and is another Yankee right fielder, much like what Roger Maris was going through, you know, kind of playing against a ghost in a way. But probably not to the same degree. Uh, yeah, that's uh, that's a thing. We'll see you at the ball game, I guess. And I'd just like to say, if you have been watching this whole thing, thank you, thank you so much if you've gotten to this point. And all I ask is, would you please share this video? Because I... I feel like this story needs to be spread more, not for my sake, but more as a, a legacy thing for my sister, because I just want people to know that she was an awesome person and, and she'll always, you know, I'll always carry her spirit with me and try to live the way she would have. So, so thank you again for watching. If you've gotten to this point, please give this video a thumbs up. And if you're feeling a little bit nuts, a little bit cuckoo, a little bit screwy Louie in the head, subscribe to my channel. This is probably the best video I'm ever going to make, but don't let that discourage you. Thank you so much, everybody. Have a good day.